nation. I really, God is the answer to this present day problem, mm. without a shadow of a doubt. I've spoken to people that are into a lot of the lockdown gatherings and groups. I've been asked to speak with someone who I invited me to Glasgow. He wants to have a conversation with me. And some other people want to have a conversation. I don't know why they want to have a conversation with me. As if I'm a connected man. I'm not a connected man. I'm a thorn in the side of a lot of ministers. And um, so I've not got any connections. I've not got any friends <laughs> in, in the ministry. Uh, I have got a couple, but praise the Lord. Glory to God. Now, I'm going to carry on with um, the, the Word of God today, which is faith. Um, like never before, as I said last week, we need faith. Especially the days that we are moving into, I want to tell you this, we need to be a people of faith. Again, Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and He rewards all those who earnestly seek Him. I'm a little bit hoarse, I'm going to take a little drink of water. It was all that singing, glory to God, because it's not great to sing with open faces and open voices before the God of heaven. Hallelujah. And I'd like to sing my heart out. I was singing much earlier this morning, but anyway, praise the Lord. There we go. So, without faith, though, you need faith. The Bible says, or you won't be able to please God without faith. And everybody's been given a measure of faith. I brought that out last week as well. Romans tells us every single one of us has been apportioned faith. You can never have believed in the Lord if you didn't have faith. God had given you faith to believe in God. The people out there that do not believe in God are faithless. They don't, they, they're not able to believe in God because they haven't got the faith to believe in God. And I speak to people all the time. And, um, and, and Friday I was out in the streets again because I don't just tell you that we should be evangelizing. I take the lead and I evangelize. And I believe every single one of us should be an evangelist. It might be your neighbour across the road. It might be something you meet in a supermarket. It doesn't take rocket science. It just takes an opportunity to say, that person's lost and is going to a lost eternity. Yeah. And you might have an opportunity. It doesn't mean we have to speak to everybody. But you just can make one or two. Is that right, Will? Glory to God. There's a man sitting in the back there because I had a conversation with him on Friday. Praise the Lord. A divine encounter. And he's back with us today and he was at the meeting yesterday. And that's just because I was out just doing my usual stuff. Hallelujah. So let us be a people of faith and we, can, and, we can, and we can share. We all have faith. And because we need faith, especially in these days. Remember 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, For we walk uh, by faith. One verse says, We live by faith, not by sight. Amen. Amen. But verse 9 in 2 Corinthians 5 and 9 says this, We make it our goal, Paul says, to please him. And so we make it our goal to what? To please God. Do you know that's what we are here for? To please God. Yeah. I think that might come shocking to some people who believe that God exists to please us. <laughs> and it's just that God just exists, that, that God created us so that he runs around just to appease us and please us and just bless us as if that's God's role. Can I tell you? No, it's not. God created us so that we will please him. Our job is to please God. And when we walk in pleasing God, then God's love flows towards us. Hallelujah. When we live in a pleasing way before God, then God's love flows towards us. When we do not please God and we become God's enemies, then God's wrath and his anger is against us because we're living in sin and we're displeasing him. Amen. So we're called to walk in obedience and to please God our living God. I thank God There's sometimes, I don't say I feel it all the time but when you can just feel the blessed, the peace of God and you just feel as if I remember I wasn't that long saved and um, I stood in this hill one time, not my hill I've got just now, that was another smaller hill and I remember I just got out and I love the sky, I like the stars shining and the, and the moon I've always loved that even before I acknowledged God in my life but now I'd acknowledge God in my life and I stood out there before an open heaven and I'm looking at the stars and I'm looking at the moon and I'm going, wow, oh Father, you're so glorious and wonderful. You're an amazing God as I looked and I seen the heavens opened and the glory of the heavens shining above me. And at this moment in time, I've never felt it ever like that. And I'm only a young Christian. At that moment in time, I felt as if the God of heaven was actually looking right at me. This little bit of dust and this little planet amongst Billions of planets, so they tell us. And I just felt such a sense that God was looking at me and I felt his pleasure towards me. And I started crying like a wee boy. Hallelujah. Yeah. It's good to cry. Because yeah. I used to think, you didn't cry. You take a beating, but you didn't cry. But it wasn't good for a man to cry. 
Hallelujah. It is good for men to cry in the presence of God. Hallelujah. When we can allow <coughs> our hearts to be touched and we come a little bit more emotional and we're not just too rigid and iron because we think that's a tough thing to be. Yeah. Women have got one over on this. They just take it the extra mile. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Glory to God. He made us all different. Hallelujah. So, so we need to find out, the Bible says, how do I please God? I mean, do you ever wake up? Do you, ever, do you concentrate on that sometimes? And you know, I know we can't do it every minute of the day because we've all got business to attend to, okay? But do you ever think, Father, how can I please you? What can I do to please you, Father? What would you have me to do? What would, you know, and you start to think now, how do I please God? Well, men, you know, if you want to please your wife, we could probably, I'm rubbish at it, ask them under seriously, but you know, chocolates, a little kind of diamond ring here or there, a little bracelet, a little treat. I've just picked us up a lovely little holiday or something like that. You know how to please one another, don't we? We know how to appease, or is it please? Is that peace? And anyway, we, we know how to bless one another. But how do you bless God? Because you can't give God, oh, there's a wee box of chocolates and, you know, and send them to heaven or something like <laughs> a bunch of flowers. How do we please God? And this is why we've got to ask ourselves these questions. And um, we live here to please God. And ask the, ask the question, I'm just emphasizing this morning, how do I please God? Are you pleasing God? Who are you living to please? I feel sorry for you if your whole life is concentrated on your wife. I feel sorry for you. And hey, I feel sorry for you if you just live for your husband. And it's all you want to do is please your husband. Mm. And I feel really sorry for you if you just look for your children, just to please your children. And that seems to be the order of the day just now. I remember the days when parents used to rule children. Their children rule the roost. Yep. They rule the parents. Mm -hmm. Anybody identify with that? Minds were up a little bit. But today, honestly, it's the kids that are ruling the roost. And we're running about constantly mm. trying to appease them. When actually the children actually be raised up and they should be loving to please us and helping us. Glory to God. I just another wee sideline down there and we threw that in there. Glory to God. And so we can see these things. Hebrews 11 and 8 to 10 is going to be my kind of scriptures for today. I'll read them from this little book, a Bible that I brought back from Israel. Instead of Jesus, it says Yeshua, okay, so just in case. Um, you wonder why I'm saying that, but I don't know, but it does say Yeshua in this portion of scripture actually. But it's good to say Yeshua because that's what his name is. It's not Jesus, it's Yeshua. Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. And we'll read a couple of verses here, and it's on the subject of faith. Abraham, of course, is called the father of faith. So if you want to understand faith, then we need to really study the, the man Abraham. And just a few verses here in Hebrews, it's a chapter of faith, chapter 11. And we'll read a couple of verses, reading from verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place, would later receive as his inheritance, who obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with them of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations who are, whose architect and builder is God. And that's the heavenly Jerusalem that we're all looking forward to. Glory to God that one day will appear upon this earth. Hallelujah. And I look forward to that day somewhere away in the future. So glory to God. But it's something that we can look forward to. Hallelujah. Therefore, Romans 4 and 6 says, Therefore the promise comes by faith. Glory to God. Because Abraham is the father of faith. The promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. That's why the Bible says we call him Father Abraham. Hallelujah. The Jews hate that when we call him Father Abraham. Take your hands off of our Abraham and our law and our Torah. Don't mind us having the Noah, the, the Noah covenant, the God cut a covenant with Noah. But keep your hands off the covenant that God cut with Abraham. No. He is the father of the faith for all of us who believe in, the, in our God, but the father of faith. He is the father of those who are under the law and he's the father of those who are outside the law. Glory to God. He is the father of all of us by faith. Hallelujah. For he was a man that walked in faith before the Lord. And the Bible says he is the father of us all. So glory to God. Father Abraham. I've got any trouble sometimes. I've been in Israel because they get very upset with that. It's like, 
They don't mind tolerating you, but as soon as you start to mention it, we, you know, we call him Father Abraham and he's ours. They get upset with that. But he is ours. But we've been cut into that covenant yeah. that God cut with the children of Israel. Hallelujah. We are part of that covenant now because we are believers in Yeshua. Glory to God. Oh mm -hmm. God, has still got a very special place for the Jews, so I acknowledge that also. Praise his wonderful name. Glory to God. So Lord, it says here, it says here, by faith, he, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. So he <coughs> was obedient to walk to the call of God. Hallelujah. God called him. God called him. Do you know the greatest voice you will ever hear is the voice of God calling your name. Amen. The greatest voice you will ever hear is the voice of God, especially when you hear the voice of God when he calls out to you and he calls you by name. We can think of two great <laughs> episodes. Moses. Remember Moses is wandering around in the wilderness. He is 40 years now. And all of a sudden one day there's a burning bush and Moses gets attracted to it and the, the voice comes from the bush. Moses. Moses. And this caught Moses' attention, didn't it? And then and Moses had a powerful encounter with the living God. And another one I like is Samuel. Remember when Samuel was a young lad? His mother dedicated him to the priesthood to Eli and his two sons. And there he was, this young lad. We don't, tell, we don't know how old he was, but he was young. And he was sleeping beside the tabernacle of the Lord. Amen. What a place. What a place for the veil would have been in front of it. And young Samuel and his little FY, he was training to be a priest. And then he is sleeping right next door to the very tabernacle, the very ark of the living God. Hallelujah. And he hears a voice, Samuel. And he doesn't understand who the voice is coming from. So he runs up the stairs to Eli, who is crashed out. Probably a bit like me, I'm dead when I sleep. The Lord was had to have blown a trumpet in my ear, I think, to catch my attention. He says, Eli, you called, and we know the story. So he says, I didn't call, you go back and lie down. The Lord calls again, and he says he still thinks it's Eli. He runs back up again. And this happens three times, and then eventually Eli twigs on. The Lord is calling the lad. Hallelujah. You know, there's times in my life as a minister, I know I, I can see a call of God in people's lives out there in the fellowship, and I try and encourage them. Sometimes somebody else can see a call in your life. You might not see it. Thank God you've got spiritual leaders over you, and they can see something in you. They can see this. God is going to do a work in you. And you might not notice it, and sometimes it's good when they eventually switch on and say, do you know something? There's a call of God in your life, and you need to get before God. Because having a call of God is one thing, then you need to start walking a different walk. I use this as, a, as a, an illustration, and it's nothing to do with the faith, but it was a, a young cousin, John McInnes, his name was. And young John was a fantastic footballer, even at a young age. Diehard Ranger supporter, I might add as well. But he played for St. Mon Boy Club. But that was the days when Alec Ferguson was in charge of St. Mon. But John was a bit of a wild character. I mean, he was brilliant. I couldn't get by him. I used to get angry. I used to beat him up sometimes. That was his big cousin. Couldn't get by him. He was brilliant. Well, Alex Ferguson seen their talent as this young lad, but he also seen when he was going off the rails. Alex Ferguson turned up at Manny Trish and Uncle Lean's house and, she spoke, and he spoke to him and says, Listen, this boy's got amazing talent. You better rope him in. He's got a future, but you need to deal with him. He can see that wild side. Well, John went off. John just carried on in the wild side, the wild side of life. And then... Um, never pursued a football career but you know he could have had a future they really stuck in and really dedicated themselves to the sport just get caught in the drink the drugs and all that business fighting kind of character john was and then um, and he missed the boat <clears throat> now let me bring that into the kingdom of god do you know there's many people missing the boat in the kingdom of god because even though the call of god is there but the world is there as well to try and pull you away when you get that call, I want to tell you this, it's an amazing thing to hear the voice of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's somebody here today, if you can hear that voice. It's the most glorious voice you will ever hear. And just to bring it so that we can all attach ourselves to the call <coughs> in Acts and 2.39 says, when Peter stands up and gives that glorious preach to a multitude of people, he finishes and he says, the promise is for you, your children, and all who are far off. All whom the Lord our God will call. Do you know, every single one of us get a call. You might think, well, I've not heard the voice of God. It might not be a physical voice, but you, God called you. Mm -hmm. His voice, you'd have, it, would have been, it would have been heard internally, whether you heard it physically or not. But every single one of us have been called by God. Does that not make you feel good? Abraham, Samuel, Moses, and stick your name in there as well. We have all been called by God. If you're saved 
born again, received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, surrendered your life to him, you're called. And that should make you feel special. It certainly makes me feel special. A wee naughty, pathetic lifestyle that I used to live in. Hallelujah. And now the great God of the universe called me. And that night I stood there before him. And I want to tell you this, that experience still sits deep within my heart. This great God that made all of these things was now in my face. Yeah. Couldn't physically see him, but the invisible God. Mm. I sensed it and it broke me. Hallelujah. Mm. Glory to God. Yeah. Thank God for the call of God. Yeah. It's a powerful thing indeed. <clears throat> but not only do you get the call then, there has to be obedience to the call. Because now God calls us many times. The, the Lord will come calling. And then and we need to then be obedient to what God is calling us to. Hallelujah. Obedience is costly. I've got written down here. Depending on what you are being asked to do. Obedience is always costly. There's always a price to be paid for obedience. Yeah. Once you hear that voice and know that voice, I want to tell you this, then you have to do something about it. Because God's given you a free will. Will I follow or will I not? Will I, will, you know, will I be obedient to the voice? <clears throat> One that comes readily to mind, and you'll know the story, is in Matthew 14. And then um, we'll just probably just, we don't have to turn there, but it's Peter walking on the water, isn't it? Is that account when Jesus is out, uh, sends the disciples out after the great multitude have been fed with the, bre the bread, 5,000 or so? And Jesus seems to send them across the sea route, go over to the other side. Jesus stayed, dismissed the crowd, and then he goes up into a high place to a mountain and he spends time in prayer. He led us by example. He was always having special times of prayer. Just him and his father and every single one of us need to take a leaf out of that book mm -hmm. and do the same thing. You'll be nothing unless you put your own personal life in prayer. Listen to me. You'll be nothing without prayer. Nothing mm -hmm. without prayer. And I cannot emphasize that enough. You will be nothing without prayer. If you're not a man or a woman of prayer, forget it. You'll do nothing for God. You need to be a man and a woman of prayer. Prayer is a key to all things, hallelujah. And it's only through prayer and being in that special place with the living God that you'll get to understand God and you'll tune your ear to hear his voice, hallelujah. And you will build up a personal relationship when you spend time with him, hallelujah. And prayer is a place where we spend time. So we know we're out there in the high seas. It says Jesus then looks out and sees the boat is out in the middle of Galilee. For anybody who's been out in a boat in Galilee, it's a beautiful experience. I don't know if I'll get there this side of eternity, but who knows, you know, maybe the Lord will be gracious and open up the door and I'll slip through the net and find myself there, and that <laughs> kind of, and I'm praying for that, I'm praying that the Lord might open up a door and a whole load is okay with Israel, that would be wonderful, yeah. wouldn't it, praise the Lord. Doesn't look like it just now, but there we go, who knows, <clears throat> and that's faith, isn't it? We need faith for that. Glory to God. And so he looks out and then he says, he then begins to walk in the water out to where the boat is. And it says, I don't know why, it says, it says, it seems as if Jesus is wanting to pass him by to get to the other side and then they notice him. It's funny that, isn't it? It seems to suggest, now, I ask myself the question, why did Jesus walk in the water in the first place? Why did Jesus not just fly across to the other side? Or why did Jesus just not kind of disappear and reappear? Because obviously he could have done that, he could have just appeared on the other side. Why did Jesus walk in the water? What is the question sometimes I'm asking myself? What was the purpose of Jesus walking on the water? And by this time, it got very choppy, it got very, it got very, the, the wind started blowing. And it says, here's the men of faith in the boat, the apostles. And when they seen him, they didn't recognize him and they were terrified, they were full of fear. Ah, it's a ghost! You know, don't forget, they've been used to cast down demons and things, but now they're in, they're in a boat and it's high, it's dark. It's between the hours of three and six, so they say, the fourth watch of the night. The wind starts blowing, howling, the waves are up, and they see a figure walking on the water. That's enough to freak any of us out. Mm. I mean, I walk, I walk in darkness quite a lot, I might add, and sometimes, you know, I'm walking there and a twig breaks or something jumps up for me. The hairs of my neck are woof! And I'm shammed up here and I'm on the road. <laughs> Honestly, it's freaky sometimes. I mean, I've walked in darkness and, and when a mist comes down, I'm, I'm very limited to what I can see. But I like to walk in darkness. Glory to God. Anyway, I know what it's like to be, especially when it's dark, it's vulnerable. You know, you're, you're doubly vulnerable when, you, when you're in a darkened environment. You're, you're not seeing clearly and, and you're, you're, you're easily spooked. I've been spooked quite a few times. 
Hallelujah. Praise God. So now they're spooked and, 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 they, and, and they kind of cry out and Jesus says, Be in peace. It is I, the Lord. Mm. Wonderful to hear those words, isn't it? When you're spooked and you go through a difficult time and you hear that, just thought, Be still. The Lord is here. And of course, why then does Peter say, and I don't, why does Peter say, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. Well, why does Peter say that? I mean, is Peter doubting who it is? Well, of course he couldn't have doubted who he is because then Jesus shouts back, come. Well, if you weren't sure it was Jesus, were you going to get out the boat? <laughs> Not in your life. Mm -hmm. So why, what made Peter say this? Who knows? But we know what Peter says, Jesus says to him, come. And by faith, Peter steps out of the boat. Now this is a fisherman, this isn't some guy that's just a, you know, that doesn't know the environment. He knows what fishing in deep waters, he knows the dangers of going overboard, that that could be, you're basically, your life is gone. But Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking towards his Lord and his Saviour. And it's wonderful, isn't it? What a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And then we realise, it says, but he takes his eyes off the Lord, or maybe a wave came off, or darkness, and, and, and Jesus has been obscured. And all of a sudden, now he loses sight of the Lord, he becomes full of fear. Mm -hmm. And he begins to sink. And immediately he cries out, Lord, save me! And I love this, it says, immediately Jesus was there. It wasn't, it wasn't like Jesus had to kind of run across, whatever, how far he was there. Mm. It just it immediately was there. He takes him by the hand and picks him up and says, Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Mm. Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And it says then he continually walked back um, to the boat. I mean, what an amazing experience. I mean, come on, guys. Could you imagine that you're walking hand in hand with Jesus on the water? And the other disciples are all in the boat, man. Would they not be envious? There you are marching across the sea now with the Lord. You're, you're full of faith because you've got your hand in the mighty King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, of course you'd be full of faith when you're marching with Jesus. And the disciples, yes, were full of faith because they lived in with the Lord of glory with them. Hallelujah. And we also are walking with the Lord. It's just that we don't see him in that physical sense, but the Bible says he lives with us and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's where we need to be, that people of faith. No, we shouldn't go walking in the water. We don't hear anybody else walking in the water. That's foolish. That's not trying to jump off a bridge and kid on, you can fly. Amen? A wee funny there, a lad for that, because Steve Lindy, a, a, a bit of correspondence, Steve Lindy used to be the director, or the editor-in-chief of Jerusalem Post, and I keep in touch with him. He's no longer there now, and, and there was this little article they had on Facebook, and there's um, <coughs> Steve's getting the jag. My fourth shot, he says, long story, don't ask the question, but I'm feeling fine. And so there's all these other comments, and most of them are English, because about Steve, I wouldn't have a clue. And so I couldn't resist making a big comment. I went, I've had those shots, and I'm also feeling fine. <laughs> I says, I thank God for my immune system that, uh, that fights disease. It's been working fine for over 60 years and I thank God. Yeah. And then, anyway, so, man, I started getting a few comments because other people would make comments. And one of them was this, I think her name was Helena something. And she says, I'm really pleased that you're putting all your trust in your immune system. She says, do you go outside and flap your arms and think you can fly? <laughs> now, I thought, she's obviously a little bit being, you know, sarcastic. And um, so I couldn't resist firing in a little comment, so. I says, dear Helena, I says, do you flap your jaws at before you speak? <laughs> I says, this is real, that was really childish, and I never looked at any other comments, and I, said, I, just, I just responded. Because that was foolish on that side of an argument, but anyway, that was just a little bit of a, a little kind of, word that I just tend to find out there. I'm, I'm losing a lot of friends, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like Steve. Steve. Steve's a really good guy. I, I don't know where he stands in faith, you know, but every time I go over there, we catch up, we catch coffee. He's came and addressed a couple of the groups, and so I trust he's not going to get too um, upset with me and maybe his friends. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but we can see here again, it's like, but that's taking that step of faith. Is, is, is a major thing, you know, and Jesus then rebukes something and says, why did you doubt, O oh, ye of little faith? You know, it's easy sometimes, but see when fear comes in, faith is out the window. And I think the principle here is, here he's walking on the water in faith, yeah. 
Fear comes in and what's the first thing that happens? Faith now is gone and fear's gripped him and now he begins to sink. Mm. Jesus says you get faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be you up and lift and throw cast into the sea and if you do not doubt it will be done for thee. Now that doesn't mean you say we run around and start talking to mountains or talking to trees. I mean Jesus is not speaking this way at all. I, I get people that just go way off the deep end with all this kind of things and oh we're trusting God for a Rolls Royce, hallelujah, get faith. You know, just don't insult my intelligence and use the word of God for these ridiculous things. And we don't mess around with faith. But I want to tell you this when God gives you faith, hallelujah, it's a different matter indeed. But generally, when you want to walk, you put obedience to the call of God to walk in this when God calls you to do something, as Peter did. Sometimes God's commands don't make sense, but He's called us to obey them anyway, doesn't He? Sometimes God will ask you to do things, and it doesn't make sense. Hallelujah. But as long as you know it's the Lord, you be obedient to it anyway. Do you remember the Lord spoke to Ananias? Ananias, uh, and when um, Saul, the, the great persecutor of the church, he, he ended up getting struck down the maze, Damascus Road. He's now in Straight Street, blinded. And the Lord then speaks to Ananias and says, Ananias, I want you to go and pray for this man, Saul. Because he's seen a man coming to him, laying hands upon him, he's going to see him. And, Lord, I don't know if I want to go and pray for this man. This man's a... This man's a bad man. He's, 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 he's persecuting the church, putting people to death. And the Lord says, go. For I've got a plan and a purpose. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when you hear the voice of God, it's not always going to be, oh, that'd be wonderful, it'll be a sign. And they may ask you to do something, you don't want to do it, but you need to be obedient to it. Mm -hmm. Because he's called us. Hallelujah. Get ourselves into a place where we can hear the voice of God. I can show a lot of stories with that. But hey, it just doesn't always mean to say it's going to be great. I believe the Lord today is rocking a few boats and he's upsetting many believers in the church today. I believe it 100%. You know that old expression, hey, don't rock the boat, man. <laughs> Which means, like, don't upset the apple cart. Everything's fine. Don't rock the boat. Scary when somebody starts rocking the boat. I remember as a young lad, remember the, 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 the fair friends, it was that big wheel. Emma, you like this one? So I'm in the big wheels. You know, I'm not really scared of heights, but I'm up there and there's wee this crazy guy with me, crazy guy next to me. So we're up at the top and he starts throwing the thing. I'm telling him, I was screaming, come on! And the more I said it, he was enjoying it more. And he's walking this way and walking. I'm like, ah! Tell me you want to get down to the bottom. We thought it was dead funny. It's that expression, it's that don't rock the boat. We don't like it when things get rocked, do we? Especially in that kind of environment. It can be quite scary. Indeed, hallelujah, we've plenty of time. Thank God, I think the Lord slowed this thing down today. <laughs> but you know that expression, people saying, look man, look man, just don't rock the boat, you know, just don't, don't, don't rock the boat, everything's cool, everything's fine. I remember the day that I took a step of faith and then rocked the boat here at Eastgate Church. Rocked the boat, a day happened in 2020. I made a decision as a leader of the church, which didn't go down well with many people, it was actually Friday the 29th of May, which actually was Pentecost on the Hebrew calendar. We had a special prayer meeting in here. Some of us are still here at this day. And there was 10 of us, and we met in here with a special prayer meeting. And the church was getting opened up on Pentecost Sunday, 31st of May, 2020. It's a big decision. Uh, I didn't ask anybody's opinion on it. I just felt it was right in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you've just got that place of faith, you just have to say, I just, I just had to... I just had felt I had to do this. This is what I was doing. And they started to rock the boat in this church. The, bo the, the boat was rocked. I mean, seriously rocked. And um, it was wonderful on that special night of Friday night. Alex was baptised. It's probably the baptismal service that night and everything. Man, we really went for it. And, um, and what a powerful time of prayer we had in this church. I mean, I, I mean, it was powerful. And then we were opening up the church on the Sunday. I could have opened up the church a couple of Sundays before that. I knew it was in my heart to do it, but I thought, what better day to open up the church? Augusto, than Pentecost Sunday, the day when the church was burst. Hallelujah. It just so felt so right. And here we, we went for, I think it was a 13, 12 of us, and I think Liz wasn't up on that Sunday. But everybody else was a bit upset with everything. And, um, you know, because like everybody else, we had closed. But can I also say this? The prayer meetings never closed in this church. Ever closed. Our morning prayer meetings were always on in this church. I thought, I'm not going to be shutting prayer meetings. But we did, like everybody else. Hallelujah. 
And not many people wanted to come to church. They, they thought that was a, a terrible thing that I had done. And in fact, I thought some of them said it was totally irresponsible. And I was putting them people's lives at risk. It was elderly people in the church. And I was going to be putting their lives at risk. And they, so they tried to dump all of that onto me as well. Some of them I knew they weren't going to come back. We lost probably the 65, 70% of our congregation. It wasn't big, it was roughly around 40. And, um, and, and I remember it very clearly. And, um, and then I had a meeting with some who were you know, quite close to me and, and they wanted a meeting, they wanted to meet up with me because they tried to, we need to understand what's happening. And so we had a conversation and I remember they were saying to me, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? Open up the church and, and where are you going with this? And you know, and then we spoke for a, a period of time but I was unable to explain myself. Because I'm saying this, I, I said, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I'm doing or where, well I know what I was doing but I said where we're going I said I'm not sure but I said I know I believe it's his voice and he's taking us someplace and I've gone down here over the Jordan John and I remember a priest I, I said him once that was like we're crossing over and John encouraged me and he says, he says Arthur I get it I get it I know but other people just didn't get it mm. you see that step of faith caused problems I caused a problem now I've caused a problem because every church was closed, everybody was happy, we were all doing the Zoom meetings, hey, the boat was nice and steady, everything was great. Now all of a sudden I took a step of faith, now the boat's rocking. Why did you have to do that? Some of them came and said to me, everything was fine, Zoom meetings, in fact, look at all these people now are watching us on the Zoom, we've got more viewers than ever, I mean, hey, the, 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 I really feel that God's going to touch the community, why did you have to do that? All of a sudden now I created a storm and I created a problem. And I never asked them to come to church. The fact that I says the church is going to be open this Sunday and every Sunday. That's all I said. Now it caused a problem. I'm, I'm glad. Because now they've got a decision to make. Do I come to church or do I not go to church? See, there wasn't a problem when all the churches were closed. I'm just talking to one congregation. Now I created a big stishy storm. <laughs> Why did you have to do that? You make this, make a decision. Now we don't worry. It forced them to make a decision. And what I'm believing just now is, see this whole business of COVID. You know, you, everybody oh, it's a devil, this and devil. Listen, God is using COVID to test His church. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. To test the hearts of His people and say, where actually are you? <clears throat> Trouble is, though, Zoom is actually now clouded everybody's consciousness and thing. Now they're saying, Zoom is the new white skin. This is the new way we should do church. Let's not sit there and physically have to be next to people. We can all meet virtually. Wonderful. We're all in the room, but we're not in the room. The virtual world has arrived. Hallelujah. I know pastors are running the space. Go on. I know you brought me all that crowd. I can just sit in my house and go to my computer. Okay, hallelujah. How are you, everybody? And some churches are growing and all these little faces all over the place. Hi. Hello. Some people's lying in his bed. Go We're all in the same space, it's a virtual world. Hallelujah! We don't need to drive miles down the road, the highway get upset with people blowing horns. <laughs> get the kids really stressed out every time we come in church. I didn't have kids before, you know. I know what it can be like. And it's just a horrible experience. Every time I get there, I'm, I can't receive from the Lord, I'm blowing the horn all over the place. The kids are agitating me in the back, I'm screaming like a madman. I get any church, I'm, by the time I'm, I'm just finding myself, it's just having a cup of tea and I'm back on the road again. Obviously, I'm taking that to the extremities, but you do get moments, you don't get moments like that, or was it just me? <laughs> so the virtual world. So now I created the problem. The boat's locked now, and people have a lot of upset, and, and a lot of them just decided, well, we're, we're just going to go and find another boat. Praise God, I'm glad they found another boat. Good luck to them. I felt to open the church, I felt it was the voice of the Lord. And I've had conversations with other people and said, well, we had the, the voice of the Lord told us to stay closed. No, no, listen, either God says open or stay closed. It's not, God's not saying to me, Arthur, you open up and the church up the road, you stay closed and everything will be fine. No, no, the Lord is the double-minded, guys. We, we don't serve a double-minded God that says one thing to one person, says something to the other person. I'm very logical, I might not have a degree, but I'm pretty logical to fact to say, well, either it's right or it's wrong. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not, you don't need Einstein's brain to work it out. Hallelujah. 
But in the midst of it, God is starting to shake things. And, and I believe, you know, God was dealing with his church, dealing with the world, and dealing with the unseen world. Hallelujah. Let me push on a little bit. So we had that, and, they, um, and that, was, that, was a, that was the situation. Glory to God. So we lost a few people. Hallelujah. And if any of them listen to tape, I don't miss any of you. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, might think that, you, you might think that's pretty, um, that's pretty severe. I, I'm just telling you as it is. I believe God. I believe God took them from me. I really do believe that. Amen. I believe God removed them from me. And guess what? God gave me a bunch of people. Amen. Hallelujah. He gave me more back than what he took away. There's a better atmosphere in the house. There's a far greater atmosphere in the house. Because I've got a bunch of people that just seem to appreciate this place. I don't know why he's a wire to me. Hey, praise God. I used to have a bunch of other people used to sit there like... <clears throat> I mean, honestly. I'm not saying all of them. But never get a bunch of people saying, oh, thank God for this church, I thank God for these travel yeah, yeah. fire and bricks. And honestly, it breaks me into insight. I'm like that, wow. Father, just bless these people. It, it makes me, as I said before, it makes me want to rise up and get yeah. closer to the Lord. I trust it's making everybody feel that way just now. I thank God for what he's doing in the midst of this. But let's just get back here into the man Abraham. So we know that Abraham is called, and you'll find that way back at the end of chapter 11 and um, in the book of Genesis, so it's pretty early on. This man, Abraham, uh, is called. In fact, it's actually, it just says there, the, the last verse, it says, And Terah, who was Abraham's father, his son Abraham, his grandson Lo, and, you know, and, and, you know, and Sarah, and all of these people, they, and, 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 and some of the people that are with them, they, 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 they're called and they go, instead from up, and they go to Haran, and they stop in Haran, and then before they go to the land of Canaan. That doesn't tell us how long they stayed in Haran, but when they get to Haran, they, he, he prospers. I mean, Abraham's obviously quite a good businessman. We don't read into that. But he prospers in Haran. In in and then when his father Terah dies, then chapter 12, then God speaks to him and says, Now get out of there. Get out of your country and go to the place I've told you to go. Hallelujah. And we read that in Acts 7. Stephen tells us that. It says Stephen called him and called him, you know, and, and called him out. Hallelujah. I just wonder if I've got that down here. Praise God. So we have that lot there, and again, he's now called to leave Haran, and now he heads to the promised land where God has called him to go, to the land of Canaan. <clears throat> now, I love just what it says, as I, I read with you, it says, he's called to go by faith, but he doesn't know where he's going. I mean, that sounds ludicrous, doesn't it? You know, he, 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 he walks with God, he responds to the call, and he starts walking with God, but he doesn't know where he's going. I mean, that doesn't seem very logical, but we know that it's obviously God was directing his footsteps. See, when you respond to the call of God, just that inner witness within you, you will find the place where God is leading you. Hallelujah. You'll find the place. If you stay close to him in prayer and the word of God, and you, you attach yourself to a good church, and you're getting a hearing good preaching, because yeah. a lot of rubbish getting preached, and maybe somebody says, well, you know, maybe, maybe some people say, I'm preaching a lot of rubbish as well, but that's up to them. Obviously, we got a bunch of people left and didn't obviously value that, so praise God. But I want to tell you this, God will lead us by His Spirit. The Bible says, those who live with the Spirit, the, the Spirit of God will lead us. Keep in step with the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Because God will lead us to where He wants us to be. Yeah. There's nobody here by chance if God has led you here. Hallelujah. It's been a direction of the Lord because God is just shaking things up and you find yourself here at this moment in time or wherever it is you might find yourself so he walks by faith. Hallelujah. You know, maybe somebody here today is it's like you may, you may be in the boat and God is actually rocking the boat because he's wanting to move you out the boat. It's dead easy to stay in the boat when things are, you know, when you, when you know, to just hunker down because it's my place of safety. And don't kid me on thing. We've all got safety places, guys. That could be a house, but even internally we like to wrap ourselves up sometimes. And I don't like taking wee steps of faith. I don't like this. <laughs> You know, I'm, leave, I'm, leave, I'm losing my comfort zone. Haran was a comfortable place. Abraham was doing phenomenal in Haran. He ended up getting a lot of people, a lot of slaves, of slaves in those days. He became very prosperous. And now God speaks to him again and says, now I want you to go to the land of Canaan. A strange place, didn't know where he was going. But by faith, he now puts feet to the call and he heads off, which is going to be hundreds of miles with this whole group of people and all the animals and everything else that he had there. Listen, sometimes I say when you, to be obedient to faith is a big thing. Don't think it's an easy thing to just take steps. 
I cut my teeth in faith. I was raised in a ministry in faith. Ben Patu. We did this building in faith because I felt in faith. I looked at this building and I said, God's going to give me this building. Hallelujah. For nothing. Amen. And it was nothing of me. It was faith. God gave me a gift of faith to believe for this building. Hallelujah. I had it in my heart. I had it in my sight. I focused upon it and I felt it was a God. And I prayed into it. And glory to God, we are here today. We got it for nothing or a tenner. Which is nothing as far as I'm concerned in the life track. But it was by faith, the government. When I had to step out, I had to step out of places. It was uncomfortable taking my kids. I had to step out of a job. I wasn't doing very good in the job anyway. I was self-employed. I came through a couple of recessions. I wish I was in the business I knew. I mean, I'm flourishing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was tough. And it was awkward and it was difficult. And my, we were outside the churches and my kids were struggling. And it was a struggle. Yeah. And if I say to you anything other than that, no, I was, I was lying to you. I, I, I stepped out, I came out of victory, got my credentials. ALG Minister, 1999, 19th of April, Pristat in Wales. Paul Weaver signed me off. Hallelujah. Now I'm, you know, and I just said, well, I'll wait for God to open up a door. I'm not writing letters to the four corners of the United Kingdom, which I was encouraged to do. And hey, I went into a wilderness period, and I might tell you this, it was difficult. I feel as if I'm walking through, what was all that about? Where am I going? I don't know. Sitting in my house, <coughs> visiting me churches here or there, nobody phoning me, nobody encouraging me. Nobody said, oh, come on over, Arthur, you can preach in my church. Or you can come over and preach to my pensioners. Nothing. Maybe what, a couple of scraps. So I know what it's like just to just feel, like, Lord, and, did I hear you right? Am I, I'm on the road, am I, am I running away ahead of myself? Am I? And sometimes it's like that. When you're out in the sticks and you're wandering sometimes and you're, you get tested. Because sometimes it's a long road. It would have been a long road from Abraham to get to the land of Canaan. But he had that inner witness within him. Hallelujah. And I want to tell you this, I wouldn't change my journey for, the, for anything. And I've told you before, I know what it's like to be tough times. I know what it's like to be in debt. I got taken to debt coats because I couldn't pay my way. I'm trying to run a wee business. I took me all my time to put petrol in the van. Couldn't pay my bills. Get took to court unjustly. And the judge says, how do you plead? Sorry, he did. I have to confess this. I went guilty, Your Honour. It was something like a five hundred pound fine. I took out an ad with Paisley Express to try and boost my work. Never get one ad. Never get, I never even get a phone call from the Paisley Express. But anyway, <coughs> couldn't pay it. Told them just hang off. I'll do my best to pay it. And then they increase your debt. Then they increase your debt. And then they eventually took me to the, the, the court small claims and just said, "How do you plead?" I mean, Yo, look, I'm, I, I want to pay it, but I'm not in a position to it. And it's all they say is, "Right, okay." And then the debt is up again. So it starts off like this, and then bang, you know, you're paid, you've got to pay this. So I know what it can be like, hallelujah, but when you know that God's in the midst of you, and God's going to work for you, it will keep you on the journey, and it's not always going to be plain sailing. That's what you need to know, you've got faith, you've got faith, you've got faith, hallelujah. Yeah. It's faith that we need, that we just have to say, Father, I've got faith in you. I remember one time, we, I thought we were going to lose the house. I was standing outside the front doors there, things were difficult, Linda thought she would start up a wee business. She gave up, Erskine, and I told her to give up because it was, it was really just getting her down, dragging her down, the, the whole thing changed. And, and these words came out of my mouth. Just give up the work, darling. We'll trust God. Amen. She went, oh, I thought, oh, thank you. <laughs> I was like, what I just say? I felt like reeling the words back in again. <laughs> Open my mouth and put myself in it. And I want to tell you that, that was a company car went and 20 odd thousand pounds a year. Now we were trusting God. As car gone, 25 grand gone, and now I'm walking again with faith again. And then we got this idea, start this week in a business, and it was pathetic. Anyway, it just didn't work. All of a sudden, then I took the mortgage of years, and then before you know it, built up, built up. I was standing those two front doors out there. And I just said, you know something, Father, see if I lose this house, then let me lose it. But I'm trusting in you, and by faith, I am believing, Father. Yeah. I'm trusting in you. And that night, somebody wrote us out a cheque for five grand. Amen. Bailed us out. The wee job, the wee business of London's bang, shut down. <laughs> and she managed to get a job the, the, the following week, and we managed to get there. But I know what it's like to be standing on a precipice, standing and, and looking down a big dark hole. Mm -hmm. I know what it's like. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I don't just talk about faith. I know I love faith, and I've tried my best. And it's not always honest, it's not always work, but glory to God. I'm sidelining here. Time. <laughs> Let me finish with a flourish. So now he's, he's in the land. 
And, and as we read there, it says, but he's a stranger in the land. God's made him a promise. I'm giving you this land. This is your land, Abraham. I'm going to give you the land. He gets to the land, but it says he's living as a stranger in a foreign, a foreign land. God made him a promise. It's yours. He's got the title deeds from God himself, but he's in the land and he's, he's a stranger in the land because it, although he's his by promise, but he's not got the title deeds on it. Mm-hmm. But he had the promise. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. And Jacob and Isaac, Isaac and Jacob also had that same promise. They were strangers in the land and they lived in tents. Yeah. They were very wealthy, I might add as well. You know, there's a lot of struggles you need to read. The, I love reading the book of Genesis. Hallelujah. But listen to this. There's a spiritual picture in this. Nobody says that. Do you know something? See this earth, it belongs to us. We've been given a promise by the mighty God. Forget about going and living in heaven, guys, okay? You might die there, you might go to heaven just now, but we're coming back to this earth. This earth is our home. That may burst a couple of people's bubbles. <laughs> Heaven's coming to the earth. Hallelujah. And we are, our home is this earth. And the Bible says that we are going to rule this earth with the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know something? We're born about this earth as strangers. Unless anybody here, does anybody want about the earth? <laughs> and guess what? We're living in tents. What's these bodies? Yeah. The tent. Peter says, I live in the tent of this body. Mm-hmm. Can you see a spiritual picture in that? We may be strangers in this land. God has given us the title deeds to it. He's given us the promises to it. This land is our land. We are going to rule this world with Christ. This is our inheritance as the children of God. It's ours. We still find ourselves strangers in the land and we're living in tents. Mm-hmm. The tents of these bodies. Mm-hmm. But the day is coming when the King of Glory is going to come back again. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. And we are going to be loosed from these tents. And now we are going to be ruling this world with our Lord and with our Saviour. Glory to God. And it's faith that's keeping us on the journey. Hallelujah. Fraser, it's faith that's kept you all these years. Glory to God. And you're still going strong. Hallelujah. I can mention so many other names. Guys, we're called to be a people of faith today. And like never before, we need to step up in our faith. We are getting into choppy seas. You think it's bad just now? It's going to get choppier. But in the midst of the choppiness, we're going to see great miracles. Our Savior is going to be coming to us often. And we're going to be a people of faith. And we're going to see great things. And I'm not concentrating on the powers of darkness and all the book of Revelation that's going to unfold before us. I'm choosing to believe in the mighty God of heaven who's going to do great and awesome things in the midst of a people of faith. And he is actually working in the church just now. And he's separating his 300 just now. It was interesting as well. If you read further on there, it says Abraham had 300, well, it was 318 mm-hmm. trained men in his house. Yeah. Just remember that. It was 318. I just read that. Anyway, glory to God. Our God responds to faith. Yeah. Our God responds to faith. That means, do you believe him? Do you really believe him? And as I said last week, you can't just believe him 90%. 90% doesn't cut it. You need to believe, you believe, you believe. And Abraham believed God, and we might actually get there the next time up here as well, when we really go for the big promise when he has to offer up his son. And off the back of that, great blessings are given to all of us because of that one act of Abraham, hallelujah. And we're all being blessed for it. Glory to God. Let me finish with a word of prayer this morning. Father, I just thank you again for your word. I thank you, Father, Lord, Lord, faith. I pray, Lord, that faith, Father, will be built up in your people today. I only can speak, Father, and even though I speak from your word, Father, it needs your Holy Spirit, Lord God, to come off the back of it, Father, to build us up, to breathe upon us, to stir us up, oh God. And I just pray right now, Father, that you stir up that faith in your people, Father. I pray, Lord, that... Lord, there might be people here today, Lord, and they feel as if they've messed up, they've missed out. They feel as if, Lord, as if, Lord, the, the, the boat's gone, sunk. But, Lord, I just thank you just now, Lord God, that it's not over until it's over. And I thank you today, Lord God, that you're well able, Lord God, to revive. You're well able, Lord God, Father, to speak into a situation. You're very well able, Lord God, to communicate, Lord God, that it's not over. It's not over, Lord. And I just say that for somebody just now, you're sitting there. I, want you, I just feel in the Lord to say, it's not over. It's not over. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless your people today, Father, I pray. Father, let faith arise and let the enemies of God be scattered. I pray, let faith arise in your people, Lord. And whatever giants are in their lives, whatever, Lord God, is coming against them, Lord God, and they're pressing them. I pray, let faith arise, Lord God, Father. And Lord God, let Goliath, Father, be put down in the precious name of Jesus. 
Father, continue to do your mighty work in our midst, Lord God. Blessings upon all of us here this day, oh gracious one. Thank you for what you're doing. Bless us now, I pray, Father, in the glorious name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Praise amen. the Lord. If anybody needs prayer, anything, then please.